On Sunday, we have been studying a series called The Healthy Church. <clears throat> Last Sunday, we began a mini-series in that uh, subject of the healthy church, dealing with uh, communion, the factors of communion with God. In uh, the pamphlet that we have, 50 Things You Receive in Salvation You Can Never Lose in Time and Eternity, this is one of the four sections in that where we list the nine factors, we called it the factors of communion because they're, they're vitally important to the cup of the Eucharist that we, some people call it the Lord's Supper and communion. We call it Eucharist. <clears throat> um, and and uh, there are nine factors, and they're all related to the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. Paul even refers to it as the blood of the cross. <clears throat> there are nine factors, and when you take, take the cup, he tells you, do that in remembrance of me, and you should reflect on these things. So I thought it would be important for us to go back through that so that we could have an understanding of some of these words. Last time, we dealt with reconciliation. Today, we're going to deal with grace reconciliation. Today, we're going to deal with grace redemption, and it's, it's discussed in um, verses 7 and 8 of Ephesians 1. <clears throat> he says, in him we have redemption. There is our word. In, in him, Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, Adam's sin, according to the riches of his grace. Now watch this. It is the riches of his grace which he has lavished upon us. There shouldn't be a period there. There's a period in my English Bible. There should not be one. And it should continually read which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. The reason there's no period there now listen to me very closely. Verses 3 through 14 is one Greek sentence. <clears throat> one Greek sentence. <clears throat> Paul picks this idea back up in verse 14. Remember, 3 through 14 is one Greek sentence. One, it's a very long <clears throat> Greek sentence. Look how he closed it in verse 14. This is how he closes that. There's a period. The Holy Spirit of promise, verse 13, at the very end of 13, says, who, the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Now, redemption is not the only doctrine that's listed in this long Greek sentence. There's a lot of them. <laughs> but he opens, sort of opens and closes with that idea of redemption. And he uses a very interesting Greek word, which we'll introduce to you today. <clears throat> very interesting Greek word. <clears throat> These nine factors... These nine factors of communion with God are important when every time we take the Eucharist, every first month when it says, do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> That's why these are really important. They All of the nine factors deal with the blood of Christ. <clears throat> okay? And so that's going to be an important issue for us. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into our morning study. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. As far as the study of the Bible, it's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You cannot live it nor learn it <clears throat> in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be in the category of mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. <clears throat> These must be confessed in silence prior to study in order to remove you from carnality of the flesh back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit for Bible study. 
And it's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living and learning. <laughs> so, Father, we thank you today that 1 John 1, 9 secures for us the promise, the Holy Spirit promise, <clears throat> that we could be restored by confession of sin. You are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us and restore us to spirituality. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit indwells us at the point of salvation. We thank you. And he'll never leave us, John 14, 16. He is there for the duration. We thank you for that. It's now our responsibility to allow him to do the great work that he's been sent to do called the church age of the new covenant. So encourage our hearts today, Father, through the truth of the word of God as we study it for application in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that's interesting, point number one, about this long Greek sentence in verses 13, uh, verse 3 through 14, is uh, we always look for markers. Like I just showed you, one out of, out of seven and eight, you got 14. It's the re word redemption. It's used, there, there are different words. The way this word is used is very important for us, this Greek word. But I want to show you another marker that's really important to this long sentence. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. Now, it's the word in Christ <clears throat> or in him or in some form of the idea that we're talking about Christ. If it says in him, they will usually, <clears throat> if you have a New American Standard, they will put a capital H. <clears throat> now, on your paper, I listed them for you. <clears throat> so I want you, I'm going to read through 3 through 14. I want you to watch for the word in him, in Christ, or in the beloved, whatever. I list it. Listen to me. There are 11 of them <clears throat> in this passage. And you always, as a student of the word of God, you're always looking for markers. What something that's being that's carrying the ideas, and boy, it is that one. Eleven times in one Greek sentence, even though it's a long one, he pounds this subject of in Christ. Now watch this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. There is no period. In love, he predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intentions of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he bestowed freely on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of riches of his grace, which he bestowed upon us, no period, in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the time, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ. Things in heaven, things up on the earth, no period. In him, although we have obtained an inheritance, haven't been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things according or after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who has given us a pledge of our inheritance of you to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Eleven. That's a whole lot of in hymns, isn't it? That's a whole lot of him in, in hymns. And it just dominates it. Once you see it, it just dominates. This, this is one Greek sentence. He just dominated it with it 11 times. <clears throat> now, why did he do that? Because under the new covenant, this 
little in him every time. It's in, E-N, it's a preposition, it's a prepositional phrase. The word in is E-N plus the locative of place. Every one of these. Now, it's important. N plus the locative of place. In the Greek language, that's how we identify it. In theology, the New Covenant theology, this is really important. Because what it's teaching, every time it says in him, it's teaching positional sanctification. Set apart in Christ forever by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. At the point of salvation, you are baptized into Christ and into the body of Christ. Galatians 3, 27, you are baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the church, the body of Christ. At the moment of salvation, these two wonderful functions of being baptized by the Holy Spirit functions to your benefit. Galatians 3.27, at the moment of salvation, he baptizes you into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.13, he baptizes you into the church, the body of Christ, at the point of salvation. Evidence of that is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit who in this passage says he seals you and is the down payment of a future redemption of your body. A redemption of your body is to come later. The redemption of your soul comes first. The redemption of your body comes later. Redemption covers it all. It covers salvation, the Christian life, and your life in eternity with the Lord. Redemption. Redemption is a very powerful idea. <clears throat> and grace redemption is what he's talking about. How do I know it? Listen to how he described it. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in Christ. Now, there's two pretty strong words that come from the mouth of God that you and I would never be able to imagine, riches lavished from a divine viewpoint. In your wildest dream of everything you could imagine about riches and lavishness would pale in comparison to what he's talking about. Because this comes from the heart of God. This comes from the mind of God, not from the world. I mean, who could phantom what God means when he talks about riches? It would be way beyond the millions and trillions and zillions. I mean, who could, who could even fathom that idea? Yet he, these are the words he used with it in reference to our salvation, redemption, you have no idea. <laughs> and where did he get the value to put on that? Where did, he, where did God get the value to say that your redemption is the riches of God's grace lavished upon you in Christ? Where could he get that idea? Where could he get the idea to put riches lavished on us? You know where he did? The blood of his son. The cost. The blood of his son. Who went to the cross and died on our behalf to take our judgment so that we could have his righteousness and was raised from the dead to give us justification forever with God. Wow. I've studied this stuff a long time. That overwhelms my soul. He says to me, Ron, you have no idea. <clears throat> no matter what you think would be the richest, richest, and the most lavish, lavish, pales in comparison to what God is talking about. <laughs> and he boils it down to the blood. The 
price of redemption is the blood of his son. The blood of his son. The blood on the one half is the humanity of Christ and on the other half is spiritual removal of spiritual death. On the one hand, the blood is the eternal life of the Son of God who is sacrificed on our behalf to remove our spiritual death. He calls that <clears throat> part of this riches of grace. <clears throat> and over the weeks, we will look at nine ideas on this same subject. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at reconciliation. <clears throat> Today, we're looking at redemption. It is a powerful idea. <clears throat> it is a powerful idea. <clears throat> Remember that every time you see in him or in Christ or in the beloved, it's going to have a capital H, and you look and you'll find in on the front of it, and that's in plus a locative, and listen, that's that every time it is. Listen, write this on your piece of paper. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, there it is. He is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Every time you see this word in him, you're talking about positional sanctification. And what's being taught in the context is positional truth. Because in him refers to a, a position or a place. In plus the locative of place. And the place is a him. Come on now. And the place is a him. And the him is Christ. Jesus Christ. <clears throat> But in plus the lock is his position. It's the position in the person. If any man be in Christ, he is redeemed. If any man be in Christ, he's reconciled. If any man be in Christ, he's born again. And so the list goes on. <clears throat> we talk about the 50 things that you can receive in salvation. You can never lose in time and eternity. And that's not the only 50. That's the, we stop at 50, just to try to overwhelm your soul with grace of God. Because how could we ever discuss with you the riches of God's grace lavished upon us through the blood of his son? How could we possibly do that? And so we attempted different ways. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, 14 on your paper. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord. You know how you got to be that? Saved. 20 status privileges. The 20 status privileges in the pamphlet, 50 things, is that you're a brother, you're part of the family of God, you're the brethren, the family of God, the royal family of God in Christ, and you're the beloved in Christ. These two are part of the riches lavished upon you. You have an inheritance. You're an heir with an inheritance. This true is lavished upon you. God's grace is so marvelous. It's called the riches of God's lavishly lavished upon us. He calls that grace. You can see why the devil hates it. Hey, that, for you to get that idea in your heart. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Holy Spirit and faith in the truth that is the gospel. It was for this that he called you through the gospel that you may gain the glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may gain the what? You see, this is part of the riches of God's grace lavished upon us. Listen to that. Listen to that. That you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 4, not on your paper. The last part of that verse 
touches this idea. The last part of the verse talks about Satan, how he tries to blind your minds to the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Watch this. Who is the image of God? Let me go back and read 2 Thessalonians 2 at the end of verse 14 when he says, and you may gain the glory of our Lord. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you gain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, you reflect the glory of God himself. Are you with that? I didn't make it up. I just read it. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. You tie those two together, and you now understand the riches of God's grace that's been lavished upon us. Lavished upon us. You know what that means? He spoiled us. We've been born again with a golden spoon in our mouth. Not a silver one. I don't go for silver. Go for the gold. This is part of this wonderful grace salvation package that comes through the gospel. Christ dies on the cross. He's buried. He's raised from the dead. All of that comes from the blood of the cross. All of this comes from the blood of the cross, the blood of the person of Jesus Christ that was worthy for God to set the price. Who set the price? God set the price of your redemption. God set the price of your redemption. You didn't set it. Jesus didn't set it. And when was that set? In eternity past at the Eternal Life Conference, before the foundation of the world. Boy, the devil hates this message. Oh, this is one he hates. This is what he hates, because we snatch him right under his nose from this message. The gospel of grace snatches him right under his nose and pulls him out of the fire. He hates this. <laughs> he hates this. That just tickles me that he hates this. Here's the second thing we need to know about redemption. The second doctrine, which we're discussing today, that we're talking about in the factors of communion with God is the grace redemption. We've got to really understand that redemption is because you're in Christ. It's not because you go to church. It's not because you're religious. It's not because you believe in God, one God. It's, it's not that you're trying to do the best you can so that when you die, maybe God will do the best he can with you. That's a can of foolishness. You must be in Christ. And the way you get in Christ is to believe the gospel of Christ and be baptized by the Holy Spirit to be placed there. It's got to be born again, baptism in union with Christ. Boom, boom, boom. Because the moment you believe the gospel, you get eight works of the Holy Spirit, part of the 50 things. People, listen, they either call me, write me, or say to me, they have never heard this before. <clears throat> I'm just getting tired of hearing that. We really need to pray for men in the pulpit. Now, I know there are a lot of guys out there who teach the truth. I know that. I know a lot of guys out there who teach this. I know them personally. So I know I'm not the only lone ranger. I'm not the only need that has not bowed to Baal. But I hear from a lot of people out there in churches that don't hear this. We need to pray for the church to get back to basic, basic gospel truth. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one thing that ought to be straight up and straight down in the church is grace salvation. In him we have redemption. Notice 
the, that the word have redemption is separated. Notice that the word have is the verb. Echo, and it's a present active indicative. When you're in Christ, you're there always. You don't get in Christ and then go like, well, I think I'll jump out. <laughs> you didn't jump in. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit, Galatians 3.27, into Christ. And once you're in Christ, you are in the present tense. That means forever. You know why it's in the present tense? Every day with Jesus is better than the day before. Come on. That's why. I know that's why I don't sing. It's in the present tense. In him we have. In him we have. In him we have. In him we have the present tense of redemption. You have it every day, every day, every day, every day, in time and eternity, every day. It's continuous action. In him we have redemption. You don't have it anywhere else. It's in Christ or it's not there. You don't jump in and jump out because when you believe the gospel, you are baptized into Christ. That's grace. That's the work of the third member of the Godhead. Some people call that the Trinity. It's okay with me. I don't care what you call it. Why don't you call it? We have redemption. Notice there's a definite article, 10, and then apolotrosis. That's a powerful word, a powerful word. Look down. I broke that word down. It's, it's made up of three important parts. The word apo is a prefix. Luno, lutron, is the noun, and sis is a suffix. And all three of these are important. All three of them are important because they took the word release, lutron, and they added two parts to it that blew this thing way out. Apo is the, pressure, is the preposition away from. Lutron is, is a noun referring to the ransom price that's required to be paid in order to release someone from slavery or from prison into freedom. And when they're released into that freedom, that's a new standing. For whatever they were here, once the ransom is paid, whatever they were here, when the ransom is paid, they are free. as if this never happened. Freed as if this, if they were a slave here, they're a free person here and never considered a slave ever again. You understand that? And so he put the oppo on the front of it, that if you're a slave here and the ransom price is paid to get you out of slavery, when you're out, away from that deal because it's, the price has been paid, you are free as if you never were a slave. You're a freed man. You have all the rights that freedom brings. You have all the rights that God has given the free man. You have the rights. That's a powerful word. Then he adds the suffix cis on the end of it, which means the action of grace. And all of that, all of that, is the riches of God's grace that's been lavished upon us. And all of that, we call it redemption. 
But no, that we call it redemption, Paul says, because it is the riches of his grace that has been lavished upon us. <laughs> the devil hates this message. He hates it. Oh, he hates this. <laughs> yeah. If you just took the word lutron, lutrosis, like I did on the bottom of your paper, which is used in Hebrews 9.12, it refers, to, listen, it refers, the emphasis is on the release upon receipt of payment. <laughs> now watch this. Hebrews 9.12. And not through the blood of goats and calves, Old Testament, but through his own blood. Through his own blood. Through his own blood blood. You know where that blood comes from? It comes from God. Did you know that? It's called the virgin birth. Did you know that? Did you know that? When Jesus said, if you, he who has seen me has seen the Father, we're talking about the real deal. See, you couldn't see God. He says, you're kidding me. You can see him in me. I'm the mirror. I'm the mirror image of my father. Think about that. <laughs> and guess who you are in Christ? The mirror image of Christ, who is the mirror image of God the Father. Think about that. You know how you got that? You got it by grace. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't deserve it to have it now. But you got it. You got it for now and forever because of God's grace, because you had the good sense to believe the gospel. That declares that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Not only through the, never, not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy, holy place, heaven, once for all, once for all, one death for all sin, for one time, forever. Having obtained what? He came to earth, went to the cross, gave his, gave God's blood a sacrifice for sin, returned to heaven in the honor corps, because he had secured eternal redemption. You know when you get it? At the point of salvation. You know, long, you know how long you have it? As long as you're in Christ, which is forever. People say, well, you know, you can jump into Christ, you can jump out. You don't jump into Christ. You've got to be baptized by the third member of the Godhead to get in Christ. When you believe the gospel, it's automatic. You live in the church age. You live in the day of the new covenant. Uh, people lie to you. Uh, people lie to you. I give you scripture. Here's another word on the other paper. Or on the back of your paper, I guess. You having fun, Billy? All right. I'm having fun. We got the devil so nervous today, he won't drink a cup of coffee at halftime. He's too nervous. Watch this word, anti-lutron. See that word? This word is used by Paul to emphasize substitutional ransom. There's a long discussion by Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 7. I'm pulling verse 6 out. Now, it's well worth your read or I wouldn't put it on your paper. Uh, 
Kirk, when you was teaching history class, did you ever tell them that? If I was you, I'd write that down. You might see it again. They're, <laughs> they're going to see it on test day. I say you might, it might be a gate question. Uh, that's my point. Now, look at this. In verse 6, watch this now. Watch this. Because this word is used. He who gave himself, that means alone, as a ransom. There's the word, anti-lutron. A ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. That is, the time on the cross. The proper time was his time on the cross. Ah, how tough was that for him? Oh, huh. <laughs> huh? He sweat blood over that one, didn't he? I mean, he sweat drops of blood, not sweat. I, th I, thought, I think that's interesting how that was stated myself. I think that's really interesting. But in Matthew 26, 39, not in your paper, he says, yet not as I will, but as you will. You know what he, what he understands? That God set the price of redemption. Jesus knows that better than anybody in Gethsemane. God sent the price of redemption. And the price of redemption is his blood. The blood that flows from God through the virgin birth to Jesus Christ is going to be offered on the cross for the sins of humanity. God set the price. And Jesus says, I must go voluntarily. I must go voluntarily. That's why it's Jesus and he alone. And why it's by faith and faith alone. And it's by grace and grace alone. I'm hollering a little bit just in case the devil went, got set out in the car or something. Because there's too much to set in here with you. So he's sitting out in the parking lot, waving to people to go by. So there's my people. Don't stop. Go on. No, mm -mm. This is not the church for you. Just go on down the road. But there it is. Who gave himself as a ransom, and there's our word. Substitutional ransom is what that means. Jesus, in Mark, the 8th chapter, not in your paper, but Mark, the 8th chapter, verses, oh, I don't know, 21 through 38, somewhere like that. Jesus is in Caesarea with his disciples. This is Mark's account. This, this is Mark's account when Peter rebukes Jesus for talking about going to the cross. And he tells him, get behind me. This is Mark's account. What I find interesting in Mark's account about this is two questions that Jesus told the disciples they should answer. The first question is listed in Mark, the 8th chapter, verse 36, when Jesus asked, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and, profit his, and forfeit his own soul? And he was in a discussion with them about him going to the cross and being the ransom Substitute ransom for the sins of mankind. I find that to be a staggering question among humanity. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit the riches of God's grace that he's willing to lavish on you? What profit could there be in the world to pass up the riches of God's grace, which he will lavish on you. Why would you, well, would you pass up that deal? I find that interesting. I find the word interesting, profit and forfeit. Because whatever you think is going to profit you apart from Christ will forfeit your soul. 
I find that to be interesting. Prophet forfeit. He asked a second question. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, that's a highly debated question in the church. Do you have a possibility for an answer? I don't want it verbally. I want you to think about it. Because let me tell you, there are a thousand answers for that question in the church today. Not in this one. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Doesn't have to give anything, does he? <laughs> huh? Who gave that exchange for him so he wouldn't have to make it? Who gave that exchange? Jesus Christ on the cross. Paul said it's on the cross that the blood of Christ is shed. It's on the cross. It's the blood of God his son. It's the blood of God's only begotten son. exchange anything. I gave up nothing. Got everything. Gave up nothing, Horton. Gave up nothing. Everything, everything that I had in my past, today in Christ, I look back, it was a dog going back to its vomit. I lost nothing. Lost nothing. Gave nothing. He gave me everything. Gave me everything. And he's willing to give me more than my heart could ever imagine. I mean, I'm amazed every day when my feet hit the floor how much God has lavished upon my life in Christ. I am so humbled by it. Exchange? Are you kidding me? Exchange? What possibly, what possible ransom could you bring when God requires holy blood? He requires holy blood. Not even the calves and the goats given in shadow Christology could do it. They looked to the one who would come and only his blood would be sufficient. Pretty strong, interesting questions, though, aren't they? In a text well worth your time to read, I can tell you. Well, let me pause here, and when I come back, we're going to get after this thing in a pretty big way. At point three, you, you'll want to stay and hear the rest of this. You'll want to stay and hear the rest of this. This is important. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful. Oh, I, mean, I, I mean, it just staggers me to even say of all the grace you've provided us. What is the riches of your grace you've lavished on us? You've just overwhelmed our souls, Father. You've just overwhelmed us. And, and you just keep doing it every day. And uh, we're so thankful. And so now it comes a time, Father, for us to give back a portion of what you've, been, you've entrusted to us. We have so much. May we be charitable with our possessions and with our finances. We can't take any of it with us. Except what we store up for ourselves, the treasures in heaven. I thank you, Father, for people who understand the grace principle of giving. Out of one's purpose in his heart. And there are a lot of ways to give. There are a lot of ways to give. We're thankful for those who do support the church and the message 
and the ministries that flow from it. We have a great board of deacons, Father, that are just great stewards in this area. And so we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we are in point number three in the doctrine of grace redemption. One of the things that people should really understand about how redemption works is God set the price. Notice, notice how I stated this in point three. God set the ransom price for redemption. Always, listen, always requires a ransom. There's a ransom price which means that the person that's been ransomed, whatever that area of ransom is, can't get out. There's no way out. There's no, he cannot produce anything within himself. That's a, actually, listen to me, that's a position in Adam. And only way out, God set the price. The ransom price, what, what would be the price? God set the price. The world has nothing. If you gathered all the wealth of the world and offered it, none of it would be there. None of it. All the wealth of the entire world, all the wealth of the entire world could not pay for this. So you can forget about what should a man give in exchange. You forget that idea. All the wealth of the entire world, that which man has accumulated and that which is in the soil or in the ocean or oil or diamonds or whatever you want to talk about, all of it. You know, this was offered to Jesus by the devil in Matthew 4. I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. A stupid bar deal that was when Christ already had it all. But he offered them the wealth of the world not to go to the cross. See, that was the point. He offered them wealth of the world not to go to the cross because the devil understands what the ransom price is. And when the ransom price is paid, he's going to hell. <laughs> I guarantee he, if he if he dropped in, he's gone again. God told you the truth. <laughs> Greater is he that's in you that's in the world. Huh? Well, Rod, I'd be careful I talked about the devil that way. Well, I wouldn't. I'm scared of the devil. Can't do anything to me without permission from God. <laughs> he is a worthy adversary, though. Now, I don't take that light. Listen, he offered Jesus the entire wealth of the world, and Jesus said, no, thank you. You know why? Because God sets a ransom price. Christ didn't come into the world to gain wealth. He came into the world to die on a cross to get souls Souls. He died for souls. S O U L. And what will a man give in exchange? The blood of Christ. God set the ransom price for redemption out of the slave market of Adam's sin. Slave market of Adam's sin. No way out of it. There's no way out of it. Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 21, is a great read on your part. John 3, 16, everybody knows it shows you what the ransom. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him would not perish, Adam's sin, but have eternal life, the gift of Christ. Boy, you know where eternal life is? In Christ. 1 John 5 11 through 13 or somewhere down there. Eternal life is in Christ. If you're in Christ, you have eternal life. In him, you have eternal life. You don't have eternal life apart from it.
You should be so glad you came to church today. You should be so glad you came to church today. This is the most powerful sermon. It's the most powerful sermon. Grace redemption is the greatest message you could ever preach. It's the greatest message you could ever hear, ever believe in. Listen to this. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 6. Why we were helpless in the slave market of Adam's sin, at the right time, I love this, Galatians 4.4, 4, not on your paper, says that at the fullness of time, God sent his son born of a woman, born into the law. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 26, when we went through uh, Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, we talked about the consummation of the age. Christ would come at the consummation of the age of redemption. The consummation of the age of redemption. Romans 5, 8. God, see, I'm in, I'm in Romans 5, ain't I? God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. You know why you're a sinner? Not because you sin, because you're an Adam sin. Because you're an Adam sin. If you're an Adam sin, if you're an Adam, you're a sinner. If you're in Christ, you're not a sinner, you're a saint. In the slave market, you're a sinner. When the ransom price is paid, now listen to me, you're going to miss this. When the ransom price is paid, you're removed from being a sinner, you are freed, and now you're a saint. You may sin, but you're not a sinner. You know why? Because of Galatians 5, 1 and 13. Christ set us free. And you are free indeed. You know how you got set free? You had the good sense to believe the gospel, and you got saved by grace through faith, and not of yourself. It was a gift. And when he did, he changed those 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin are removed from your life and are replaced with 37 things that you have in Christ, who you are in Christ. You're no longer a sinner, you're a saint. Not because you deserve it, not because you earned it. Position. In Adam, you got 13 judicial charges. In Christ, those are removed, and he gives you a plus, not a minus. You're a son, you're an heir, you're an inheritance, and all that. Or how about this one? Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin, that's Adam, Sin entered to the world. Sin entered to, into the world. Of what? People. Just like John 3, 16. People. And spiritual death through sin, Adam's sin, and so spiritual death spread to all mankind, men, because all have sinned. In Adam, all have, all are, all have sinned in Adam. In Adam, all all have sinned, all are sinners. Christ, the ransom price is to remove you from those 13 judicial charges and place you in Christ by grace through faith as a gift, not of works. Romans 5.21, so that as sin reigned in death, reigned, that's not like water, that's like master, that's like king. Sin, Adam's sin reigned in death. Even so, grace would reign. Listen to that. See those contrasts? Sin reigned in death, but in Jesus Christ, grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life. Not death, eternal life. In Adam all die. In Christ all are made alive. 
1 Corinthians 15, 22, an animal are dead. 15, 22, in Christ all are made alive. Listen, God don't take from you what he doesn't supremely give you more of, riches lavished. There's, what, there's an exchange through, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Death is removed and eternal life is given in his place. That's a wonderful exchange. You know how that exchange happened? Not by works, but by grace. It's a gift. I mean, that's, that makes my soul happy. That makes my soul happy. Number four, the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ is the required ransom price for redemption from the slave market of Adam's original sin. First Peter 1, 18 and 19, watch this. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things of this world, like silver and gold, futile, the futile ways of life, inherited from your forefathers of Adam, but with the precious blood, don't you love that? But with the precious blood is a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. John the Baptist said it the same way in John 121 when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Or in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 12, when it says, His blood is given once for all to to give you eternal redemption. Your redemption is eternal because Christ is eternal. Raised from the dead. Raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit of God that dwells in your life. Romans 8, 11. Therefore, we learn that as a substitutional ransom... Jesus Christ is the only mediator between sinful man and a holy God. 1 Peter 2, 5, John 14, 6, no man comes to the Father except through me, Christ said. I want you to write this word down because here's a wonderful word connected with redemption. And I missed writing it on your paper and didn't notice it until later. I'm going to get, spell it to you. E-X. A-G-O-R-A-Z-O. The E-X is a preposition on the front of that word. Agorazo, X argozo. Here's what that word means. Agorazo is a marketplace. What this word refers to is a purchase out make a, a purchase out of a market, in this case, slave market. It is a purchase of a slave out of a slave market price without emphasis on cost. It is, this word is used in redemptive ideas. It refers to the purchase of a slave at market price without emphasis on cost. Our other word places the emphasis on, the, on the, the word I gave you to begin with, apolutrosis, is where the emphasis on cost is. The emphasis on this word is being purchased out of the marketplace. The, the price that the asking price is paid. The asking price is paid. It is the purchase of a slave at market price without emphasis on the cost, right? Let me show you some places. You write these down. Or they may be on your paper. I don't know if they are or not. But here are, the, here are verses on that. 2 Peter 2.1, 1 Corinthians 6.20, Galatians 3.13, Revelation 5.8.9. Let me just take you to one. All of them will tell that. That's where that word is used. It will tell you the importance of it. Let me just give you one. This is one I talk about a great deal. 1 Corinthians 6, I always refer to 19, 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. 
What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of God? The Holy Spirit dwells there? And you've been bought. See that word? And you've been bought with a price. Therefore, your body's not your own. It belongs to the one who bought it. The word bought is that word. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That's that word it's used. It's also used in 1 Peter 2.1. It's used in Galatians 3.13 and Revelation 5, 8 and 9. It's a very powerful. These two words are very powerful words in the doctrine of redemption. They are very strong words. Every member of the human race who believes the grace gospel becomes a benefactor of redemption from the slave market of Adam's original sin and is set free from it forever. First Timothy 2, 6, Titus 2, 14. Titus 2, 14 says, Christ Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous of divine production. Good works. Galatians 5, 1, and then later 13. It was for spiritual freedom that Christ set us free. Who set us free? Christ set us free. When did he do that? The cross. How did he do it? The blood. That's a ransom price. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. See that little diagram at the bottom of your paper and then we'll go home. See that little diagram? Most of you are familiar with it. You got a circle on the left. It says in Adam. You can write the word in. In Adam. That's how you start out in life. Every man is born in Adam. Spirit, under 13 judicial tire, alienated, blind, cursed, condemned, at enmity with God. Is uh, the natural man, perishing, uh, sinner, unrighteous, ungodly, under the raft of God. Those are 13 judicial charges. Every person is born into as a human being. Wherefore is by one man, sinner in the world, to death by sin, and so passed on to all people of the world. Right? That's Romans 5.12. You ought to read 5.12 through 21. I mean, really read it. Don't just read it. Study it. That's really important. So, look, on that side of the circle, we got a sinner, one of the 13 judicial charges, and Adam is, you're a sinner. When you go to the other side of the page... Listen, Christ redeems you. If you're, if you're under redemption, if you're under redemption, if you're under the blood, then you're a saint. You're not a sinner. You're a saint. Then you might commit sin that don't make you a sinner. Committing sin don't, is not what makes you a sinner. In Adam is what makes you a sinner. In Adam, you're alienated. You're blind. You're cursed, condemned, at enmity, yada, yada. In Colossians 1, 13 and 14, when you read that, you discover this. It says that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, he reaches over here to those in the Adam and rescues them. They are in the slave market of Adam's sin, and he rescues them. He redeems them. The ransom is Christ on the cross shedding his blood. That's the ransom price required by God to move him from that it's called rescuing them and transferring them into Christ. He rescues Christ on the in the gospel. He rescues you from Adam and places you into Christ. Today, we call that redemption. And it refers to being ran the ransom being paid the required price set by God, the blood of Christ, the holy blood of Christ. 
that ransoms, removes this slave, puts him over here as a freed man forever. And he has all the, everything that the freed man has in Christ, he gets right then. He's a son, he's an heir, he's, you know, the whole, the whole, the 20 status privileges, for example. Over here, he's a slave, will always be a slave and nothing but a slave. Over here, he's a freed man, will be a freed man no matter what. Positionally, he is free. He's free from time and eternity. Because he's saved, he, that whole transfer, the ransom price is paid. When you believe that it's been paid, the transfer starts. He rescues and transfers. All of that is by faith through grace and not of yourself. It is a gift. I close with Romans 5.15. But the free gift is not like the transgressions in Adam. For if by the transgressions of the one Adam, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one, the man Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Oh, Jesus, that is so good. That is so good. Well, let us pray. We're going to have a, a word of prayer, then we're going to, Rick's going to dismiss us with a pledge or whatever he has. Our Father, we thank you today for the message of the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. The ransom's been paid. You don't have to pay anything to get out of the slave market of sin. The debt's been paid. The ransom's been paid. Volitionally, you can walk out. You can believe that the ransom is paid by Christ on the cross, his burial and resurrection, the gospel. You believe it, you will be rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works. Least to boast go to you when it should go to God. And so, Father, today we have boasted of you. And I pray all those who hear our voice today would have the good sense to awaken from their sleep spiritually and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead. May that transfer, that rescue transfer system occur because they have believed. We thank you for it, God. We thank you for the whole system of grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.